Naming a necessity by Kripke is one of the most important works in philosophy in the 20th century. Um, it was published in 1980, but his views had already been well known, and as you can see, uh, the lectures are dated, and the one that you're given is January 22nd, 1970, the, um, the second lecture. Um, they cover an awful lot, um, and we're only going to kind of scratch the surface in talking about proper names, because this lecture is sort of a direct response to um, the cluster theory of the cluster theory of names, where that we've just seen John Searle uh, give as a theory of proper names that proper names are a cluster of definite descriptions, uh, or at least are associated with a cluster of definite descriptions. But so much is contained here. I mean, uh, the, the, the work is called Naming and Necessity. We're focusing on the naming, but we can't really do it without saying a little bit about necessity. And what Naming and Necessity is, is most famous for, really, is talking about possible worlds. So let's say a little bit about uh, necessity and possible worlds as background. Um, we use the concepts possibly or necessarily quite often in everyday life. Not as much as philosophers tend to do, but uh, certainly possibly. The idea of possibility. We, um, we make statements like, uh, it is possible that, um, I don't know, the, the Germans could have won World War II. And then we also make claims that are, are called counterfactuals that say if the Germans had won World War II, then, you know, the trains would have at least run, run on time or something like that. Or the U.S. would have a decent um, public transport infrastructure. Uh, you know, people make claims like that. Now, like all propositions, they have a truth value. And we tend to say that some of them are true and some of them are false. But how to explain the truth value of counterfactuals? How, how do we say, how is it possible to judge whether or not it's true that if the Germans had won World War II, the US would have had better public transport? I mean, it didn't happen. So we can't say, like, snow is white. The truth, uh, truth of snow is white is determined by the world as it is. What is it that determines the truth value of counterfactuals? It's not the world as it is, because they're counter to that, the counterfactuals. Well, um, the suggestion to make sense of statements like this is the idea of possible worlds. When uh, philosopher, the first philosopher to talk about this was the philosopher Leibniz, um, born in the 1600s. So it's, it's an old idea, but it really exploded into life again in the mid 20th century and one of the people who did the most to, to uh, facilitate this is this guy Saul Kripke. Uh, so actually possible worlds now have entered uh, public culture, uh, uh, popular culture. Um, every freaking superhero movie uses the idea of the multiverse or the metaverse or whatever you want to call it. And that's basically the idea of possible worlds because possible worlds, what they actually mean is alternate universes. Now, of course, superhero movies aren't the first to do this. Uh, there's a classic episode of 60s Star Trek where they enter a parallel dimension where Spock is evil and you can tell he's evil because he's got a goatee. Um, and the, the, the great British TV series Doctor Who did a similar thing in a classic uh, series called Inferno. So it's not a, a, a new idea to popular culture, but it really seems to have taken over the zeitgeist at the moment. So possible worlds are alternate ways things could have been. Now, um, Kripke disagrees 
with another great um, Princeton philosopher, they're, they're both at Princeton in the uh, late 20th century, called David Lewis. David Lewis's view on possible worlds is like the Marvel view, in that they're real. There really are uh, different ways of, being, uh, of existing. So he would say, angels are real, just not in the actual universe. But they really exist because angels could exist, and what it means to say that angels could exist is that there is a possible universe where they really do exist. So for David Lewis, all of these possibilities are real, it's just that only one universe is actual. So for David Lewis, the universe you happen to be in is the actual universe. So actual is like uh, an indexical, which is uh, the, the, the meaning of the term depends on when it's used, when and where it's used. So it's exact, uh, actual for David Lewis is just like the word here. What here means depends on who's saying it. And so the actual uni our actual universe is one where, I'm sorry, angels don't exist, um, but there's another possible universe where they do. Kripke doesn't like that at all. He doesn't think, he's not a realist about possible worlds. He just says possible worlds are different ways of thinking about things. Uh, and they have a dispute about that, but we can't get into that. We're going to focus on the proper names aspect. But you get the basic idea of possible worlds. Now, possible worlds also helps to solve a long-running problem that bedeviled uh, Frege and Russell about uh, how certain contexts in language are non-extensional. We've already seen this um, in, with Hesperus and Phosphorus, like, uh, like uh, Plato believed Hesperus was the evening star is true. Um, but, uh, and of course Hesperus and Phosphorus denote the same things, and if you take out Hesperus, it's not true that Plato believed that Phosphorus was the evening star. So um, there you have something that violates uh, another principle of our old pal Leibniz, Leibniz of intersubstitutivity salva veritate. In extensional contexts, um, it should be the case that you can replace a term and replace it with its co-referent without changing the truth value of the statement. And that doesn't work for some contexts. Uh, and one of the contexts it doesn't work for is what's called modal context, M-O-D-A-L. Modal contexts are to do with the notion of possibility and necessity. So, uh, Frege makes this example. It's necessarily true that phosphorus is phosphorus, but it is not necessarily true that Hesperus is, Hesperus is phosphorus, according to um, Frege. And this is a problem, and he, he has to solve this problem by arguing that Hesperus and phosphorus in those contexts don't actually have the same referent. So that's why you cannot replace Hesperus with Phosphorus um, because they don't have the same referent. So therefore, you're not violating Leibniz's principle. Leibniz's principle says uh, you should be able to replace any term with its co-referent without changing the truth value of the sentence. And the way Frege saves this is by saying that yes, the principle still stands, it's just that in those contexts, in those special contexts, the referent of Hesperus is no longer the planet Venus. The referent of the term Hesperus in that context is the meaning or the sense of Hesperus. And because the sense of Hesperus is different from the sense of Phosphorus, then you cannot replace Hesperus with Phosphorus. Um, so you don't get the counterexample to Leibniz's principle. That was Frege's solution. But it relies on um, this, I, this distinction between sense and reference. The only way that Frege is able to do this is because he says names like Hesperus have both a sense and a reference. And in modal contexts, the reference of a term is its sense rather than its usual referent. Um, Kripke 
is going to deny that proper names have senses. Kripke is a million about proper names. If you remember, John Stuart Mill said that proper names denote only, they do not connote. That is, all they are is little tags or labels that pick out something in the world, and they don't do it by having a sense that describes the thing, they just do it directly without meaning anything. And Kripke believes that Mill got it right. So, the solution that Frege has uh, for modal contexts in language so that they do not violate Leibniz's principle of intersubstitutivity salva veritate is not available to Kripke. But Kripke is going to uh, save Leibniz's principle by saying that um, in uh, that we don't just talk about where, uh, when, you re when you're talking about the referent of a term, you're not just talking about the referent of the term in this world. You're talking about the referent of the term in all possible worlds. And depending on the term, two terms that refer to the same thing in this possible world, in this world that we live in, don't refer to the same thing in all possible worlds. So, for example, in this world, the evening star and the morning star, and I'm being careful to use those labels because those labels are definite descriptions. Remember, just like names, definite descriptions are referring expressions. I'm using the terms referring and denoting a bit loosely. Remember, Donnellan distinguishes between the terms, but uh, Kripke doesn't. Kripke is dif uh, has disagreements with Donnellan, as you see, he mentions him in this chapter. Uh, so I'm just going to use the terms kind of interchangeably here. Um, but uh, Kripke, uh, I'm sorry, definite descriptions pick things out in the world. So the evening star and the morning star. As Frege said, uh, Hesperus was also called the evening star and Phosphorus was also called the morning star. And in this universe, both those descriptions pick out the same thing. So, the evening star is the morning star. Um, you, uh, or, sorry, the evening star is the evening star is uh, analytically true, true by definition, but the evening star is the morning star is not analytically true. So uh, it looks like you violate Leibniz's principle, you've got a problem. Well the way that Frege solves this is by saying actually you cannot, you cannot replace the evening star with the morning star um, because although they pick out the same thing in this world, to be co-referential terms, that is, um, so that you can replace one, one with another uh, in, according to Leibniz's principle, they have to be co-referential in all possible worlds. And actually, of course, there's a possible world where the thing that you see as the brightest, um, as the first bright light in the sky in the evening is not the same thing as the, the last bright uh, light to be seen in the morning. Uh, they are in our possible world, but they're not in another possible world. So because the evening star, the evening star and the morning star both pick out Venus in, in our world, but they don't pick out the same thing in all possible worlds. And because they don't pick out the same thing in all possible worlds, they're not co-referential terms. So you can't replace one with another. Uh, the same solution works for renate and chordate. This is another puzzle owing to the philosopher Quine. He points out that in our world, uh, renate means creature with kidneys, chordate means creature with a heart. Looks like renate and chordate mean two different things, but they pick out exactly the same creatures, because every creature that has a heart also has kidneys in our world. But there are possible worlds in which creatures evolved with hearts without kidneys, uh, and vice versa, so therefore they're not co-referential in all possible worlds, so you can't replace one by one for another. 
All right, that's a little background. Um, the word necessary, philosophers use this term all the time. There's a difference between a necessary truth and a regular old truth. So it's true that grass is green, but it's not a necessary truth. It's necessarily true that 2 plus 2 equals 4. What's the difference in grades? Surely truth is just truth. Well, um, people had these concepts for a very long time, but they had no clear way of explaining the difference, so much so that Quine uh, was very suspicious of the notion of a necessary truth. Um, he says, uh, he gave an example to illustrate problems with the notion uh, of necessity at least applied to objects. He said, if you're a mathematician, it's, a, it's necessary that you be rational. You can't do math without being capable of reason. But it is not necessary to be a mathematician that you have two legs. To be a bicyclist, it is necessary that you have two legs, but it's not necessary that you be rational. Uh, what do we say about somebody who is both, who, who uh, has among his hobbies both mathematics and bicycling? Is, it, is he essentially bipedal and essentially rational? Uh, Quine gave this example just to illustrate, you know, we can't really tell, so therefore we should be suspicious of this concept of necessity. While Quine was still in his prime, along comes people like Kripke and say, we can solve this problem by making sense of the notion of necessary with this idea of possible worlds. A necessary truth is a truth that is true in every single possible world. There is no possible world in which 2 plus 2 does not equal 4. Now don't, now be careful. Sure, you can use the words. You, we can find a possible world where people say the sound 2 and they mean something different from what we mean. But that's not what Kripke is saying. He's saying, I'm not saying the word 2 plus, uh, you know, the phrase 2 plus 2 equals 4. I'm saying the actual thing, 2 plus 2 equals 4. That, by the very nature of things, by the way numbers work, 2 plus 2 equals 4 in every possible world. So it's a necessary truth. That's how we make sense of the notions of necessity. We use this concept of possible worlds. Okay, that's the background. Let's go and talk about proper names. Um, oh, one more thing though. In the previous chapter, ch uh, lecture one, Kripke has introduced this idea of what is called a rigid designator. And he says the pro that proper names are rigid designators. What is a rigid designator? It is something, a piece of language, that picks out the same thing in every possible world. Now, this is a, uh, it's an easy definition to say that, but it's kind of a slippery idea to get hold of because they won't necessarily look the same. Because after all, uh, is it possible that Aristotle was not born in Stagira, to give an example from Searle? Yes, it is. In our world, let's say he was. I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, I should know that. Um, but let's say he was in our world. But there is, a, is it possible that Aristotle was not born in Stagira? Well, with our intuitive grasp of possibility, we say, sure, sure it's possible. And would he still have been Aristotle? Yes. So the name Aristotle picks out a guy, uh, what the name Aristotle picks out in our world is a guy who was born in Stagira. What it picks out in another possible world is a guy who wasn't born in Stagira. Uh, why does it do that? Because we know it's possible that Aristotle was not born in Stagira, and what that means is there's a possible world where Aristotle exists and he wasn't born in Stagira, and that's what the name Aristotle picks out in that world. That guy, the guy who is Aristotle, that's why the name picks him out, but was not born in Stagira. So names will pick out the same thing, but they won't look the same because there's a possible world. Now, what are the limits of this? This is where people say to Kripke, wait a minute, is it possible that Aristotle was a goldfish? What's your answer? How can you tell? You can say, well, look, there's a possible world, there's a goldfish, is it Aristotle? 
And uh, here's where Kripke says, look, you're thinking of possible worlds too literally. This is where he disagrees with Lewis. You're thinking as if you can look at, uh, through a uh, telescope and see them. No, possible worlds aren't real. They're just ways of thinking about things. So it's up to us, really, to decide is it possible whether or not Aristotle could have been a goldfish. If it was, then there is a possible world where there's a goldfish that the name Aristotle picks out. But if it's not possible, then uh, Aristotle doesn't pick out that goldfish. Maybe it picks out something else in that world. Or uh, there are, of course, is it possible that Aristotle never existed? Sure. Well, in that case, there's a possible world where n Aristotle picks out nothing in that world. Um, see, uh, so there's sort of an, it makes intuitive sense. Okay, so that's the idea of a rigid designator. Now, the difference, though, is definite descriptions, which, again, are, are referring terms, are not rigid designator. They are a flaccid designator. And yes, I'm sure Kripke meant it to sound as creepy as it sounds, because Kripke was kind of a creepy guy. Um, so definite descriptions pick out the thing that fits the description. And that, of course, will be a different thing in different possible worlds. So, for example, Aristotle and Plato's best student. The name Aristotle picks out Aristotle, and pl the description Plato's best student in our world pick out Aristotle. They both pick out the same thing. But there's a possible world where Aristotle never met Plato. So the word Aristotle picks out that guy. But Plato still had a best student and the definite description picks out that guy, and they're two different guys. So definite descriptions pick out whatever meets the description, but that's not necessarily the same thing in all possible worlds. Rigid designators pick out the same thing in all possible worlds. Definite descriptions pick out whatever fits the description in all possible worlds. So in our possible world, Aristotle is uh, Plato's best student is true. There's a possible world in which that's not true. All right, back to this. This is, uh, if you read Naming a Necessity, and Kripke makes this perfectly clear, because he's rather full of himself, this uh, Naming a Necessity is an actual transcription of him talking. So he talks in complete sentences. He, and talking without notes, he makes that clear as well. Uh, he, when he's quoting, he has quotes written down and he reads them out. So it says, last time we ended up talking about a theory of naming which is given for a number of theses here on the board. He says it's a literal transcription of a lecture. He's very pleased with how um, slick he talks. So why did it take 10 years for uh, just a transcription of a lecture to be published. Naming a Necessity was published in 1980. That's unexplained. But anyway, this is uh, him just talking, just lecturing. And written on the board, he has these theses. What uh, I've abbreviated them because I'm lazy. Um, so number one, he says, to every name or designating expression X, there corresponds a cluster of properties phi, uh, name namely the family of those properties such that X, uh, that A believes phi applies to, uh, believes phi X, that is, so this is um, Cyril's idea and Russell's that uh, names come with built-in descriptions. So a speaker, for every name, a speaker believes that there's a cluster of uh, descriptions that are true of a particular name. Um, one of these properties, or some conjointly, I just said all of them, are believed by A to pick out some individual uniquely. So this needs to be true to explain, because this idea, this Phrygian idea that is fleshed out by Russell and later by Searle, Searle has the cluster theory. Um, their explanations of how 
Aristotle picks out Aristotle is that the name Aristotle means a cluster of descriptions so that, and that name is successful in picking out the individual Aristotle because those descriptions uniquely describe Aristotle. So according to this, the cluster of descriptions has to be enough so that one and only one person fits those descriptions. Otherwise, the name Aristotle doesn't refer to Aristotle. It either picks out too many or it doesn't pick out anybody. But if we are successful in referring to Aristotle according to this theory, which is not Kripke's theory, remember Kripke is going to reject this, he's a million, um, then it must be the case that uh, the descriptions pick out Aristotle and only Aristotle. So thesis number three is if a weighted most, that is uh, like, because not all of the, remember um, Searle was worried about the fact that we can discover that one of our descriptions of Aristotle is not true. Like he gave the example of suppose we find out he wasn't born in Stagira. It should, the cluster of descriptions should be flexible enough so that we can lose one or two of them and it still pick out uniquely, it still picks out Aristotle. So that's the weighted most. Not all of them because we can find out that some of them are fal false, but if a weighted most of the fires are satisfied by uh, a particular object, that guy back in ancient Greeks, then that guy is whom we mean by Aristotle. Then that, that individual object or, or you know, because proper names can be objects like uh, the Holy Roman Empire um, or, you know, uh, Nova Scotia. The, these are proper names that um, pick out non-human things. But I'm just, all of these examples, all of uh, Kripke's examples, and, and Kripke's examples are great. Um, they tend to be to do with mathematicians and scientists because he's at Princeton. He's surrounded by, you know, top minds. Princeton at the time, Einstein, I think, was probably, no, Einstein was probably dead by then, by 1970, but Einstein had been around at Princeton. Um, and they had Feynman, Feynman, who is uh, generally considered to be a, a genius, and Gödel as well. Gödel was still alive. Okay. Uh, so he uses examples just of people, but it, uh, proper names can refer to things other than people. If a weighted most of the phi's are satisfied by an object or person, then that object is the referent of the name. If nothing is satisfied by that, if there is nothing that the, uh, if there is no object that fits that cluster of descriptions or a weighted most of it, then the, the x does not refer. And, and, and this is how according to Searle, we could find out that we could find out that Aristotle does not exist. And how would we find out? If we found out that there, were, there wasn't an individual that all of these things were true of. Uh, or, you know, Shakespeare, if we found out there was nobody who wrote um, the, that, those sonnets and that play and that play and that play, they were all written by different people, then Shakespeare doesn't exist. There's just a bunch of people who wrote individually all the different things that are attributed to, to him. Finally, number, uh, or number five, the speaker knows if X exists, then X has most of these properties a priori. Remember, an a priori, something you know a priori is something you don't need experience to know. So, um, like, like that Hesperus is Hesperus. That is an a priori truth. Um, well, given the meaning of the, according to this, names mean, and they mean a set of definite descriptions. So it must be the case that if Aristotle exists, then Aristotle has most of those, because if, he, if Aristotle didn't have most of those, he wouldn't be Aristotle by the definition. Now, a priori is an epistemological notion. It's to do with what we can know. But uh, a further claim is to claim that it is a necessary truth that if Aristotle exists, then Aristotle has most of those. Philosophers have said that everything that is a necessary truth is also knowable a priori. 
Necessity, we've seen, is a, a metaphysical notion, and thanks to Kripke, among others, we've got a concrete way of understanding what necessity is using possible worlds. A priori is epistemological, that is, it's to do with what humans can know. Now, again, they were assumed to overlap in most cases. Famously, Kant said that they, they disagreed and that you could have um, some... Well, no, Kant talked about synthetic a priori. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's three parallel distinctions. There's a priori, a posteriori. That's an epistemological one. Then there's synthetic and analytic. That's to do with language. It, you know, X equals X is a synthetic truth because of, uh, sorry, is an analytic truth because it's true by the definition of terms. And then finally, there's this necessary possible possibility. And it was kind of assumed that in, uh, in the vast, uh, that, they, that they lined up. Anything that is an analytic truth is a necessary truth is uh, knowable a priori. Anything that is a synthetic truth is uh, contingent, that's the opposite of necessary, contingent is true but could be false, true but possibly false, um, and is, uh, so it is synthetic and contingent and is um, uh, a, pri uh, a posteriori, that's right, n uh, knowable a posteriori. But what Kripke is going to argue is that there are necessary truths, true in all possible worlds, that we, that we don't know a priori. But the fir first claim he's going to deny, he's just going to deny that this is true, uh, that six is true. So it is not a necessary truth that if x exists, x has most of the properties. Why is he going to deny that? Because he's a million. He says no. Aristotle could exist, and none of the things we know about him could be true, and yet he could exist. Just could. How, how do we know? Because there's a possible world in which Aristotle, in which the name Aristotle, which is a rigid designator, picks out a guy of whom none of the definite descriptions that are true of Aristotle in our world are true, or uh, that, that, are, that we think of as important uh, facts about Aristotle are true. So, uh, you know, some things will be true, like he's a human being. I, I think Kripke would deny that you could be an Aristotle and be a goldfish. But uh, you could be Aristotle and not be a student of Plato, not be a tutor of Alexander the Great, not be Macedonian, not be all of the things that we know about him. Uh, we know about him. So he just says, no, that's not true. All right, now he says, I'm going to go through uh, these other principles and uh, come up with good counterexamples to undermine those. So this is essentially Searle's theory. Uh, he actually quotes Searle in... Um, uh, so Searle says, it is a necessary fact that Aristotle has the logical sum, inclusive disjunction, of properties commonly attributed to him. Any individual not having at least some of these properties could not be Aristotle. So that's principle six, and, and uh, Kripke just says no. Um, as Kripke put it, it would seem that it's a contingent fact that Aristotle ever did any of the things commonly attributed to him any of those great achievements that we so much admire is just contingent, which means it's not necessarily true of Aristotle that he did them. You could be Aristotle and have done none of them. And how do we know? Because there's a possible world where the name Aristotle picks out a guy who's done none of them. All right. Well, but you've got to argue for that, right? Um, now, part of Kripke's argument is look how many other puzzles my way of viewing the world solves. That's part of his argument for why his theory is correct. And people have taken on the Kripkean machinery and made great uh, 
made great hay of them, used them in different areas of philosophy and say, hey, this is, this is awesome, this conceptual tool. So uh, the 70s was like an explosion of possible worlds talk and possible worlds comes up in, it, it's practically impossible to avoid possible world talk in all areas of philosophy since, um, since essentially Kripke and Lewis and, uh, and a guy called Stalnaka who, um, <clears throat> who invented uh, a way of understanding modal logic. So yes, there's a, a branch of logic that uses, uh, has special terms for the modal notions, like it has a square. Uh, here is one of the truths of modal logic. Um, necessarily P is not, oh my god, I've forgotten, what's the um, symbol for, oh, it's a diamond, that's right. Not possible, not P. Yeah, so this means necessary, this means possible. And it is true that if a proposition is necessarily true, what that means is um, it is not possible that it is not true. Okay, that's a bit of modal logic for you. Um, so this, this idea of possible worlds has really taken off. But he, in this lecture at least, he's attacking Searle's theory directly with some rather fun examples. So, for example, thesis two. This set of descriptions is believed by uh, a speaker to pick out some individual uniquely. Um, now, what, for, uh, what Kripke, Kripke makes some comment that it, it is only because of the education of philosophers that we could believe this. Um, most people, he says, don't know much about famous people like Aristotle or Cicero or Kikoro, I believe you're supposed to pronounce his name, uh, who was a, a, a Roman orator. Most people, the vast majority of people, haven't heard of uh, Kikoro, haven't even heard of Aristotle. Shame on them. But the ones who have, all they know about Cicero is that he was a Roman orator. How many Roman orators were there? Hundreds. But, says uh, Kripke, nonetheless, a regular person who says Cicero uh, says something about Cicero successfully picks out Cicero with that utterance. This is impossible if this thesis is wrong. Uh, it would be impossible for somebody where all they knew about Cicero was that they were a Roman orator, they wouldn't be able to refer to them because according to this thesis, reference is something that you achieve by having a set of definite descriptions and that set of dis definite descriptions being enough so that it is, that set is only true of one individual. Roman orator just doesn't does it, do it. And his uh, great example is uh, Feynman. Feynman, now Feynman was a, a great theoretical physicist. Uh, he was also a very good uh, communicator, which is unusual for theoretical physicists. Probably his most famous piece of um, communication is after the shuttle explosion, I think the Challenger, uh, where he uh, illustrated why it exploded and it was to do with these little um, grommets or whatever that, uh, that if you froze them they became brittle and he just illustrated it by I think dunking one in liquid nitrogen and breaking it. So he, Feynman, uh, one of these public intellectuals, very good at explaining theories, but also a, a, a genius theoretical physicist. Okay, now he says, if anybody knows about the, the vast majority of people who've heard the name Feynman, all they know, some physicist guy. They don't know what he looks like, they don't know anything about him. But that is also true of another now less famous theoretical physicist called Gelman. I keep thinking of Gilman, which is the monster in Creature from the Black Lagoon. 
Uh, but he says, look, uh, it, they know exactly the same thing about these two things. And somebody can say, Feynman uh, is a famous physicist. Gelman is a uh, uh, famous physicist. And yet, says uh, Kripke, here's what I believe to be true. When they say Feynman, despite all, they know, all that they know about Feynman being that he's a theoretical physicist, they successfully pick out exactly Feynman even though that's all they know about Gelman too. And if they talk about Gelman, they successfully pick out Gelman. So it can't be the case that um, it's because their reference depends on them knowing this set of descriptions. Thesis three, if a weighted most of the phi's are satisfied by y, then y is the referent of x. Uh, here's the great Gödel example where uh, Gödel um, is a big deal in, actually Gödel, you might say, was kind of the nemesis of Russell, because Bertrand, Ru he, he wouldn't put it that way, but uh, Bertrand Russell wrote this thing, Principia Mathematica, uh, where co-wrote it with Alfred North Whitehead, and um, it supposed to sh supposedly showed uh, or at least it was the beginnings of a project that demonstrated how you could uh, you could capture all of the truths of um, arithmetic using logic. Uh, and then along comes Gödel later and basically uh, famously proves that this is impossible. It is impossible to um, to uh, pick out, uh, it is impossible to prove all of the truths of arithmetic. Arithmetic is incomplete. I can't find the, the exact wording, but I can remember it. Um, so Gödel is uh, an incredibly famous thinker. And what he's most famous for, his most famous achievement, is proving the incompleteness of arithmetic. Now, uh, Kripke says, imagine this is true. Actually, the guy who proved the incompleteness of arithmetic was this guy called Schmidt, and Gödel essentially murders him and steals the proof. Um, if all we know about Gödel is the guy that, pick, uh, that proved the incompleteness of arithmetic, that would be enough to pick out just one individual, because it says the guy, but it would pick out Schmidt. However, when we talk about Gödel, even if all we know about Gödel is that he's the guy that proved the incompleteness of arithmetic, nonetheless we refer to Gödel, not Schmidt, when we use the name Gödel. So therefore Gödel cannot mean the thing that we know about Gödel. It must pick out the name Gödel must pick out Gödel not by use of definite descriptions. Now, you might at this point wonder, all right then, Kripke keeps saying that our, word, our names successfully pick things out. We successfully refer to Cicero even though we don't know him from any other Roman orator. We successfully refer to Freiman, we successfully refer to Gödel. How? This, is, this explains how, uh, how we refer. Uh, Kripke say, is saying this is wrong, and yet he claims that we're able to refer. Well, Kripke's suggestion is called the causal theory of reference. Um, and he says, uh, I'm not going to flesh this out um, too much because I, I'm feeling lazy, or he says at one point, I'm feeling sort of lazy, or you know, I don't like giving theories because they're easily disproved. Um, but other people certainly took up the challenge. Uh, and this is essentially what he says. And I, I love the way this begins. Someone, let's say a baby, is born. Let's hope it's a baby. His parents call him by a certain name. They talk about him to their friends. Other people meet him. Through various sorts of talk, the name is spread from link to link as if by a chain. A speaker is on the far end of this chain, you know, like a game of telephone, 
who has heard about, say, Richard Feynman in the marketplace or elsewhere, may be referring to Richard Feynman even though he can't remember from whom he first heard of Feynman or from whom he ever heard of Feynman. He knows that Feynman is a famous physicist, a certain passage of communications reaching ultimately to the man himself does reach the speaker. In other words, um, the way that I refer to Feynman is there's a causal link going from Feynman himself to my acquisition of the term Feynman. Because I, I got the name from somewhere. I read it or I heard it or I saw a video of the guy. I got the name from somewhere. And the place I got it from, got it from somewhere, who got it from somewhere, who got it from somewhere, and you can trace the, the causal chain back to the original baptism of uh, Richard Feynman. So, that's how we refer. We don't refer, uh, in other words, reference is a communal activity. According to this theory, it's very individualistic and you have to have all the information packed in your head and then you individually can refer by, um, by having a, a, a description uh, of Aristotle, say, that fits only Aristotle. And um, Kripke says, no, 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 no. Words refer because of a link that um, a link between your acquisition of it that goes all the way back to the original one. Even if you know practically nothing about the guy, you've just acquired it in a way so that uh, the usage of that term originally applied to uh, that object. Uh, and in fact, uh, Remember, Searle wanted to say that, yes, it, it has to be possible that Aristotle did not exist. So, and his explanation of Aristotle did, did not exist is our term Aristotle doesn't pick anybody out. All of the things we know about Aristotle aren't true of any uh, particular individual. And um, Kripke denies this. He says, look, biblical scholars say Jonah did exist. Now, this person existed despite the fact that they weren't swallowed by a whale, they didn't go to preach in the place that Jonah is supposed to in the Bible, and they might not even have been called Jonah, but there's still a historical individual and that's perfectly, perfectly possible. So the fact that there is no single individual that is uh, picked out by our cluster of descriptions doesn't prove that they don't exist because Jonah could still exist even though all of the things that we know about Jonah don't, uh, aren't true. Why? Well, presumably because we've acquired, uh, there was a person that was picked out by a name and that name was passed down and uh, that's what caused us to acquire this particular name Jonah. So it in fact picks out a particular individual. Um, now, the last thing that uh, Kripke talks about in this lecture is identity statements. And here he makes a seemingly very radical claim that follows from his theory that names are rigid designators. And that is that uh, Hesperus is Phosphorus is a necessary truth. And remember, uh, if this is the case, then um, one of the problems that Frege brought up to uh, that Frege introduced his distinction between sense and reference to solve is not actually a problem. Remember, Frege says, look, um, Hesperus is Hesperus is something we know as an analytic truth, but Hesperus is Phosphorus is synthetic. Hesperus is Hesperus is, an, is a necessary truth. A is A is necessarily true. A is A in every possible world. But A is B could have been otherwise. It didn't have to be the case that Hesperus was Phosphorus. Um, so that's a problem. Uh, that's why, you know, the terms Hesperus and Phosphorus don't appear to be intersubstitutive. They, they see, appear to violate uh, Leibniz's principle of intersubstitutivity salva veritate, because you take uh, one out and it changes and replace it with a co-referent and it, it changes from a, um, a necessary truth to, an, uh, uh, to a contingent truth. All right, 
What Kripke is going to say is that Hesperus is Phosphorus isn't actually a contingent truth. It's a necessary truth. It is true in all possible worlds that Hesperus is Phosphorus. Why? Because Hesperus is a name that in our world picks out Venus. And Phosphorus is a name that picks out Venus. Now there's nothing more to those names than what they pick out. Remember, he's a million about proper names. Proper names don't have any definite descriptions, don't have any information encoded into them. All they are are labels. Remember the causal theory? So basically, the only reason that Hesperus uh, picks out Venus is because somebody pointed to Venus and said that's Hesperus. And the only reason that Phosphorus picks out Venus is somebody else pointed to uh, Venus in the morning and said that's Phosphorus. But they were picking out the same thing. So, given that these, these pick out the same thing in uh, Venus, as in our world, they are names, and because names are rigid designators, they have to pick out the same thing in all possible worlds. So, now, is it possible that in some worlds they called, they used the word Hesperus to refer to something and the word Phosphorus to refer to something different? Yes, it is. But we're not talking about uh, the word, we're talking about what Hesperus is. So when we're saying Hesperus, what we're saying when we say Hesperus is Phosphorus, we say the thing that this picks out is the thing that this picks out. And that's a necessary truth because it's saying that Venus is Venus. And that's true in all possible worlds. Ha! Huh. So, that is a necessary truth. And actually, um, Kripke is going to make other bold scientific claims. He's going to claim that water is necessarily H2O. Why? Because water is the name for H2O and it has to name the same thing in every possible world. And the only thing that can be the same thing as water in any other possible world is water, is H2O. So water is necessarily H2O. Um, so Kripke's uh, like making bold claims all over the place. He, he's saying that you can know a posteriori something that is necessary truth. Why? Here's an example. The Greeks didn't know this. We learned this. We had to have experience. Oh, wait a minute. The thing we've been calling Hesperus is the same thing that we're calling Phosphorus. We just learned that. But, so we know it a posteriori, but it's still a necessary truth. So it's not the case that all necessary truths are known analytically. Some necessary truths uh, can be, you need experience to recognize. That's something that Kripke had to come along and argue for. All right, so, but in the context, and notice this all came about in a dispute about how proper names have meaning. How do proper names connect with the world? So this focus on philosophy of language has far-reaching implications. You don't get more far-reaching than every possible alternate universe. Um, so philosophy of language, for all its dryness, has had huge ripples across all of philosophy. And this is nowhere more obvious than in this famous set of lectures by Kripke called Naming and Necessity.